Uh, yes. Eventually, eventually. All right, it's rolling. I hope it doesn't fall. I'll reinforce it. All right, so um, Emil asked me to teach us to, um, I guess, give a presentation about how to teach a summer class. And so uh, I thought it would be interesting that um, all of you would come and hear what I have to say. So we're, the, we're like very in a unique position because we're both students and teachers. So we can see things from both angles. So what's the point of a class? Someone. To convey knowledge, Adam. Convey knowledge. So I put it like this. When you're through this class, at the end of the class, you have some positive delta. That's the point of the class, to, to have growth in the students. So what's the point of a teacher? A teacher is here to facilitate this growth. Now, there's been many, many studies that says that teacher ability is crucial for student growth. And Dean likes to say, you, look, you take a look at your final at the end of the class, and you ask yourself, what could I have not done if I didn't take the class? And if the answer is zero, that's a good thing, because it means you've learned all this stuff in the class. So, I think what's fundamental to how to teach a summer class is what makes a good teacher. And I'm going to try to answer both of these questions for you um, in this lecture, presentation, whatever. Um, I have a couple of handouts. First of all, what makes me qualified to do this? I don't <laughs> think I'm all that qualified to do much. Um, the first page is the student ratings for the class, and you're rated on zero to four. I have to myself. I need to read these. Rate on zero to four, a number of different categories, and then you have comments in the bottom. And so I looked at this and I'm like, wow, I did a really good job. But then I turned the next page over. Well, I didn't turn the next page over. I actually went to course ratings. And I saw that I was able to put the summer class that I taught up against all the other one-on-one classes since 2002. There are between 30 and 35 of them. And my class got the highest ratings, and I got the overall higher, highest instructor rating. Now, for those of you who know me, um, I'll just a little, uh, so there's a custom on Yom Kippur when you go to synagogue. You take your fist and you bang on your chest the whole day. The whole day you're banging on the chest. And you're saying, I've sinned, I've sinned, I've sinned, I'm a piece of garbage, a piece of garbage, a piece of garbage. For those of you who know me, you know that every day is my Yom Kippur. Because <laughs> that's how I operate. But today, um, I think I do have talent in this, so um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what made this course, I think, a success. And you could probably argue that, oh, you were an easy teacher. I, di I didn't print out that page, but... I was number seven for difficulty out of 30-something, so it wasn't because I was an easy teacher. You'll see later that I covered a lot more in this Stat 101 than most Stat 101s, and I had less time. So I just want to say that a lot of this is, again, my opinion, uh, built from my personal experience. A lot of it will be controversial, and I hope you raise your hand and, and say, and ask questions, and say you don't agree, and we could hash things out. All right? Everyone ready? So, by the way, these are all excellent teaching ratings for everyone on here. I mean, over three is terrific. Yeah, this is, this, um, it, it goes down to less than that. This is just the top of the, it, so, it's, it's a table of like 30-something, and I just cut it off at, yeah. All right, so here's what I've done. I've done a little bit of reading. Um, I read this book, well, I read most of this book called Preparing Teachers for a Changing World. It's about K-12 education in the country, written by the experts in the field. I've been reading books on psychology since high school. So I put it, I, here's my theory. So part of teaching is personality, which I'll, which is also character traits. Part of it is 
I guess, professionalism or pedagogical know-how. And part of it is just plain and simple. And these aren't all equal. I think the hard work is the you most know, important factor in this. I was working maniacally for the entire six weeks, if any of you were here for that. Um, and, okay, so we're going to begin with the personality part. So this is work that's built on, uh, going back to Carl Jung in the 20s, a book on psychological types. Uh, Myers wrote a book on gift stiffering, and the book that I think is, that everyone should read is called Please Understand Me by Kiersey. Um, it's basically about different psychological types, different temperament types, and there's four basic types. So I think what I'll do is just quote from the book. He, Kiersey has an idea of what the natural, the natural teacher type is. So I'm just going to write the traits that he finds important from the quotes. Okay. So natural teachers have ability to naturally empathize with others. They can divine the nature of others' distresses, which I call sensitivity. This may be really heavy. They can selflessly give to others. Altruism. They can bring forth unique potentials, so I could call that catalytic, or I don't know if there's a verb for this, but actualizing. They look towards others with wisdom, inspiration, and courage. So I'd say inspirational. They demand the very best in others. Demanding. They intend to broaden, edify, enlighten, illuminate, and improve. So enlightening. They are masters of transmitting ideas through words. So eloquent. And they dream up imaginative learning experiences. That's called visionary. Now, there's also this quote here. This is from a teacher at UCLA Writing School. Education has often functioned as a gatekeeper. The intent is to evaluate people and keep, it, and keep them out or let them in. The way I view education is really different. It's an invitation. It's an attempt to bring people into a kind of conversation, into a set of ideas, into a way of thinking, talking, writing, and reading. You see education as attempt to bring people in, and you automatically see it as a relationship. If the relationship works right, it's a kind of romance. So the last one I'll put in is romantic. <laughs> <laughs> Should we be taking your order? <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, um, if you guys care more about uh, what I wrote here, um, the natural teacher type, they classifies this thing called an NF, which, loosely, which stands for Intuitive Feeler. Uh, there's four types, and um, I'm not saying that if you guys weren't born in NF, just one of the implications of the book is that some people are born with brown hair, black hair, red hair, and that means they'll have brown hair, black hair, red hair, that's what their genes say. And some people are born in this type, or the NT type, or the SJ type, or etc. What I'm not saying is if, if you're not an NF, like, it's game over. I'm just saying that everyone has these traits inside of them. And when you're thrust into the role of teaching, as you all will be thrust into one day, where I was taught, like, Monday morning you start, and I, I just got to do it. Um, you should try to emphasize these traits inside of you, which everyone can do. Any questions thus far? Yeah. Is there a concrete way to emphasize these traits? Out? That's a really good question. We're going to try to uh, answer them as I go through the other parts. Of Is there a concrete way to what? Emphasize these traits. Oh. I mean, everyone's got these traits inside them. Just try to, I guess, bring them out. Yeah, but I think what he's asking is, are there particular ways to train these things separate from the... I don't know. I'd say beyond the scope, of course. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> you have to take the second half. Uh, yeah. I mean, okay, these things do have payoff beyond. So I remember back to college, I had a professor called Sam, his name was Sam Chu. 
And he was all these things. I mean, most of all, he was this, and he was this, and he was very demanding. And I took the equivalent of a 430 course with him. And he's, I don't want to say he's the reason I'm here today, but at some point along the way, you had a, a good teacher who was these things and taught the material, and you felt like, wow, this is really interesting. I want to, I want to go further in this. And I became a MCS major, which was loosely a stat major, and it was partly because of him. So that's something you probably never get compensated for, or he doesn't. OK. So. <laughs> The next thing I want to talk about is this bubble. So I'm going to probably call this hardware, software, and runtime. <laughs> For those of you who love CS. All right, professionalism. They go to town on professionalism in this book. What makes professional a professional in a profession? What does that word even mean? Universally, across all jobs, there is an ethical pledge to put the welfare of your clients first. What they're saying is when you go to the doctor's office, the doctor isn't sitting there talking about the novels he's reading or the movies he's watching. He's putting the stethoscope on your heart and, uh, and doing a diagnosis. As teachers, you have a moral obligation to put the students first, to help them grow, to help them succeed. The class is not about you, it's about them. Now, I know from my experience during this class, the worst possible classes that I gave, the worst parts of the worst classes were where I, where, when I got up there and I did whatever I wanted for me. I thought, this was interesting. I got up there. I'm like, this is really interesting. And the student's eyes glazed over and it was all over. Like what? <laughs> uh, test for variance. Something you shouldn't cover in 101. <laughs> After you cover chi-squared, which is also something you shouldn't cover in 101. Um, so I, I said I wouldn't talk about my faults, right? <laughs> we're not going to talk about the faults. <laughs> So you must be truly present in the classroom. You've got to put the students first. Now, another thing they talk about is to have the best interest of the client, you should understand profession-wide research and standards. So we're going to turn to page three. And the lawyer who I invited did not show up. But he would love this. This is not only an ethical pledge, I'm going to argue. I'm going to argue that it's a legal pledge. So, on top, a fascinating court case from the 1930s involved with T.J. Hooper, a tugboat. And now you guys can read this. Basically what happened was there was a storm. And because of the storm, all, these, all the goods on the tugboat were damaged. And, all, and the, the clients sued. The clients sued the tugboat company because they argued, look, you guys were using hand signals, but you could have used radio. If you used radio, you could have known there was a storm. And if you knew there was a storm, then our goods wouldn't have been damaged. And so they took it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court argued that if there's important matters at stake, you are obligated, legally obligated, to use the advanced state-of-the-art technology. Not just hand signals, which were the standard in the 1930s. You actually have to go the mile further and use the radio. Likewise here, what could be more important than a student learning STAT 101? That's an important matter. So I would argue you're legally obligated, with this Supreme Court decision, to know all you can about the state of the art, which I call pe sorry, pedagogical know-how. And that's what a lot of this book is about, sort of how to teach. So I'm going to give, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard um, about some of these concepts before. I know Emily has. Emily's very bored. No, I'm not. <laughs> you know what? We're going to give a, a very quick rundown on basic learning theory, or a few things that they talked about in this book that they emphasized were important. I'm going to trust them. I'm certainly not an expert. They are, and they wrote a chapter on this and said these are the most important things. So, now why do this? Because why are we going to do this? We all have tacit theories about how the human mind works. Everyone has a brain, and there's no user manual for the brain. So it took psychologists and scientists a thousand years to figure out what this user manual is. And we're, and we're maybe 1% of the way there, 2% of the way there. But however much, of the way, however much we, we discovered is useful, and it's useful to know. OK. So the first thing I want to talk about is this idea called Vygotsky's 
zone of proximal development. Right here. Or just CPD, for short. Now, of course, it sounds more complicated than it is. Here's all it is. There's a circle. There's a concentric ring. Inside the circle is what the student can do. Can do now. Outside the large circle is what they can't do now. The concentric ring inside is what they can do with your help. The idea is you're going to push them outside the circle slowly until they get to there, where then you draw a new circle, and the whole thing begins again. And this is how learning works. This was discovered circa 20s, etc. Became popular probably in the 70s. So when you teach a class, I would say, of math notation, that you should be concerned about this. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you guys who, take, who are taking 530 have seen a lot of these union. Um, so what, what this is basically saying is get the, get the lowest possible can do now, and you've got to worry about them too. And then take the highest possible can't do now, and you've got to worry about them as well. So, so I'd say the inf of this means that you've got to give really easy problems. And the soup of this is you got to give hard extra credits to ensure that everyone is happy and everyone is growing. Any questions about Vygotsky's zone of proximal development? So I index as the students? Yes, and n is the number of students in your class. Yeah. Uh, how easy is easy out of Easy is going to be pretty easy, and we're going to get that when we get to the hard work component of the talk. We're going to pass out. The next thing I talk about is this idea called transfer. Transfer is the ability to take something in a domain, like let's say you're taking expectations of random variables, then moving it outside the domain and taking expectation of brain sizes in psychology. This involves really understanding expectation to be able to move it outside of where you learned it. That's why you're transferring it outside. And here's the, what they call the gold standard to how to, to build transfer. On the x-axis, we have efficiency. On the y-axis, we have innovation. Now, if the student is just doing things that are efficient, sort of do, doing things in rote over and over and over again, they become what's called a routine expert. This is someone in an assembly line. They're building cars all day. You give them a new car, I don't know how to build that. How about over here, where they're, where they're doing nothing efficient, they're just innovating, innovating or thinking. If they're not actually getting anything done, this leads to frustration. Sort of like me in 530. It's just frustration all the time, just thinking. Now, if you do a little bit of efficiency, where you're getting something done, and then you're innovating a little bit, and you're doing something more efficient, and innovating it, etc., you're doing these in tandem, this is called the sweet spot, which leads to adaptive expertise. Which is the gold standard in learning, according to these guys. So what's the takeaway message here? You have to give them problems they can do, but make them think. Have them do and think, and do and think, and do and think. You got to do this in tandem. Pretty simple, right? This stuff is so easy. You read these papers, and it's like, it's great, because you actually sit down and read the papers, as opposed to some of the papers we read, which take a long time to read. <laughs> Any questions about the ideas of adaptive expertise? It's a race of character traits. The third thing I want to talk about, 
third pedagogical trick is this idea called the spacing effect. Loosely, it's the following. So here's time. And here's percent chance of forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> You start here, and you learn something. Now let's say I tell you that gala apples grow in California. Now you're going to know that. So you're here. You ain't going to forget, because you just learned. But tomorrow you actually may forget. And the day after, you're more likely to forget. And the day after that, you're more likely to forget. Sort of monotone, de decreasing function. <clears throat> the theory is that it's exponential, and it drops like a rock. But if you see it again sometime from now, you go back up to 100%. You're like, boom, kick back up to 100%. You know it again. And that decay parameter gets smaller. Likewise over here. This is highly accentuated, obviously. Because they're like, never, ever forget. Because asymptote is like 90%. Um, the idea is if you create augmented spacing reviews, augmented review cycle, People who know it forever. And because part of education, part of learning concepts is memory, you should, you should probably think about how to use this. What is the optimal spacing for repetition? That's a big open question. And it depends on what you're learning, it depends on what domain, etc. They know the spacing effect works, but then the parameters, pretty hazy. And whether it's exponential, also pretty hazy. Actually, Kahana did a lot of work in that. He says it's a geometric. Uh, they do exponential because obviously the, the intervals work out nicer and you get nice formulas, but who's to say the brain works like that? All right, so we're done with the um, metacognitive part of the talk, which is cognition on cognition on cognition. And we're now going to go to um, the hard work component. <coughs> Any questions on the spacing effect? All right. So now we're going to talk about this actual course that I did. page is about curriculum. So this is a um, lecture by uh, lecture by date. And I'm going to try to point out a couple things from what I just spoke about before about curriculum. So the first day, I did basic, basic set theory, which means I taught them what this is. I taught them what this is. This is, this is, you assume they know nothing and just teach the vocabulary. Because you're going to be using these symbols or words, and think about them as words. If you're reading a story, you don't know the words, you're, you're going to be cooked at the end. So if you teach them what these things are formally up front, you give them the basis for what you're doing, then once they get to the confidence intervals, they know, oh, that's just an interval where the endpoints are included. Because we just did 0, 1, 40. Pretty simple. Rather than see the square bracket for the first time, I have to interpret the square bracket and the comments of rule at once. Now you'd have to do less processing. All right, so obviously for a class like this, curriculum is fixed. That's what Ed hires us to do. You can't just do whatever you want, it's that one. Month. But you have a certain amount of leeway to do it in whatever order you want. So I just, I just add one. Yeah. I mean, so I, putting down the interval is, I mean, it's interesting. Uh -huh. I, I, I don't tell them beforehand, I just kind of assume. But I think we yeah. often, you know, we have all this, we assume they have all these little implicit knowledge. Right. It just takes one thing to completely throw them off. Right, and it's, it's much easier for me because um, I remember learning what zero, one, closed is. As you get older, you, you, you forget learning what zero, one, closed is. It's just, it's so imprinted in your brain that you can never imagine not knowing it. And so, 
Yeah. So I try to like put myself inside these guys' shoes and say, how was I back then? I think people who don't know that shouldn't be allowed to vote. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> Sounds reasonable. Yeah. Wow, you really don't want all <laughs> All right, so I don't want, I don't want them. More curriculum. So if you look at lecture five, you see I'll, I'll introduce variants. So I introduce variants formally. I do try to follow the book. I'm moving around the chapters in the book, but it's important that I think it's important that lectures in the book sort of are parallel because they get like a different perspective with you and the book. Because some people learn from the book and some people, etc. So if you look at lecture five, I introduce variants in SD. Then if you look at lecture 18, it's not to lecture 18, this is a month later, and I talk about what COV is. Now why did I do that? Why did I wait a month? It's because I know when I learned variants, it was really confusing. When I learned covariance, it was even more confusing. So between variants and covariance, they had two homeworks and a midterm, and we did it about five dozen times in class. So by the time they got to covariance, they were still completely lost. Completely. But they had a prayer. And that's the point. That's one thing I did. The second thing I did was, well, so did variance of random variables come up throughout all of this, throughout between lectures five and 18? Oh, did, yeah. Did the uh, concept of variance of a random variable come up a lot? Like when they were doing confidence intervals and when they were doing Yeah, we did stuff like this. We did this a hundred times in class. They had to calculate that using the rules, calculate the sum. Right. And they had a midterm. I told them it was be on the midterm. But by the time they got to this, they were still confused. Because they can't handle this. This is just so subtle. Such a subtle concept. Even I'm not at 100% yet. They talk about it in the book. They talk about different stages of knowledge where stage one represents you've seen it before and stage two represents you can understand it as written and stage three represents that you could, you could write on the board and explain it. Yeah. Did they get confused at all the discrepancy of... I have to warn That's you. Oh, yeah. sorry. No, 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 no. So I have to warn you, Adam asked me to be a little bit controversial. Yeah, no. He did ask me. But uh, did people get mixed up between uh, the idea of a variance of a random variable versus a variance estimate from a, from a set of data? No. And I'll tell you why. Because if you look at the lectures, it wasn't until lecture eight that I actually talked about data. So they knew exactly, if I wrote this on the board and this on the board, they know the difference. Because they knew that that data was realizations of random variables. And that we used a little x and a big X. And so when I drew pictures like this, where we talked about confidence intervals, and here's a little x bar, one, which did not make the new cutoff. Here's a little bit x bar two. They knew they were they were drawing from this distribution and doing it multiple times. So I really tried to make the lectures fit logically together. It, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, that's sorry. okay. Um, this isn't a planted question. So. Oh, no, yeah. He's, no, he was saying that he you planted questions anyway. Just a joke. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, a lot of what you're talking about, it's really interesting, very useful, but I think, to me, I don't know, one thing that's perhaps missing in this, and I don't know like what your Where thinking going? is yeah. on, on the strategies, is just the difference between people who are like visual learners and first learning from yeah, the equation, and you are, okay? Yeah. This is just the curriculum part, portion, then I'm going to go into yeah. prep and execution. All right, um, so the, the, the next place where I use the spacing effect is if you look at... I confused them big time on control theory, that is lecture 11. And I talked about type 1 error and type 2 error and what power is. Then when I got to lecture 13 of the hypothesis test, then guess what? Type 1 error, type 2 error, and power. And then when I got to lecture 17, two proportion hypothesis testing, two, two sample hypothesis testing, type 1 error, type 2 error, and power. So because they waited two days and then seven days, by the time they got to lecture 17, they're like, yeah, I get it, and I had all work in between. So once again, you should not go from variance this is to covariance, which is the natural thing to do because the book chapter 8 is variance, then covariance. And you should not go from control theory right to hypothesis testing. You need to leave a little bit in between. In between, That way they have time to think about it and process it and do homework on it, maybe take a test, etc. All right. Another little trick, I mean, I don't think 